At 19 years of age, I taught school in the west end of this county at $22 a month. And I venture to say that Mr. Newberry at this store will take in as much as that today. <coughs> Gentlemen, get the thing straight once and for all. The policeman isn't there to create disorder. The policeman is there to preserve disorder. Ross L. Hambry intersection at 15000. Contact Los Angeles Center, two minutes northeast of the stadium intersection. Expect further clearance no later than 09 or 52 Greenwich. Do it once, do it twice, do it over, over again. Good day, friends. I'm Sean, and welcome to episode two of my weird record collection. First off, I uh, just want to apologize for a few things you might have noticed in the last episode, kind of. Uh, you will might have noticed my voice changing here and then at random times. Uh, here's the thing about that. I recorded the bulk of the episode a year, maybe two years before it was actually released. And there were a couple of bits that I had to add in later. Unfortunately, at the time that I added those extra bits in, I was recovering from a really nasty cold uh, that you probably could hear in my voice. I was, I was a bit daisily, so I, uh, I have to apologize about that. Uh, I'm feeling a little better now. Still might be a little nasally. No idea what was up with the compression of most of that episode, though. It made me sound more radio than the insert bits. I was using the exact same equipment, the exact same settings, so I don't know. I don't know. Uh, technology, technology. But regardless, um, I got some nice feedback on the first episode. And uh, interestingly, a lot of nice comments about the Singing Johnson family. People seem to really enjoy listening to those because I put uh, the two Singing Johnson family albums on uh, YouTube. And people seem to really enjoy that. That's really cool. Really cool that uh, people are enjoying uh, these forgotten, possibly very seldom even known recorded bits of history. But we're going to get right into today's topic. The record that I'm going to talk about from my weird collection this episode, the full title is Memorial Store Opening Ceremony, Stroudsburg, PA, Wednesday, May 20th, 1953. That's a mouthful, isn't it? Oh, but what store? If you are really into pop culture history, you might already know what store that is, but just in case you don't, the store was a J.J. Newberry five and dime and quarter. Now, first, I feel a bit of history of J.J. Newberry is in order. So what exactly was J.J. Newberry? Well, some of you might remember the store if you grew up in certain parts of the United States, if you are, say, I don't know, um, 35 or older, perhaps. I personally don't remember it. Uh, J.J. Newberry was a chain of discount stores founded by John Josiah Newberry in 1911. The first store was in <gasps> Stroudsburg, Pennsylvania, about 45 miles southeast of Scranton, and uh, maybe about 75 miles northwest of New York City, give or take. Located in the Poconos and very close to the New Jersey state line, Stroudsburg is a small town with a population under 6,000 going by the 2020 census. J.J. Newberry himself got his retail start working for the Fowler, Dick, and Walker department store in Wilkes-Barre, Pennsylvania in 1894. Five years later, he worked for S.H. Cress and Company. Uh, some sources claim it was Kresge that he worked for, but no, it was S.H. Cress which itself was a chain five and dime store founded in Nanticoke, Pennsylvania. And by the way, just to add to the Kresge confusion, the Cress properties were eventually bought out by Kmart. Do you know what the K and Kmart stands for? That's right, Kresge. So <laughs> go figure. So after our friend John Josiah Newberry learned how the retail business operates, he opened his own five and dime in Stroudsburg, specifically at 622 Main Street. In 1919, his brothers Edgar and Charles T. partnered with him. By that time, J.J. Newberry had 17 stores with annual sales of half a million dollars. That's about $8 million in today's money. Uh, that'd be early 2024, those of you listening in the future. By the time John Newberry died on March 6, 1954, 
the company had 475 stores and would grow to 565 by 1961 with an annual income of $291 million, which today would be about $2.6 billion. Many of those stores were Brits department stores. Uh, Newberry bought the Brits chain and eventually rebranded all their stores as J.J. Newberry stores. McCrory's, a five-and-dime chain based out of York, Pennsylvania, bought the J.J. Newberry company in 1972, but McCrory's fell on hard times in the 90s and filed for Chapter 11 bankruptcy protection in 1992. Five years later, McCrory's closed 300 of their stores, including many J.J. Newberry locations. By 2000, many of McCrory's properties, including J.J. Newberry, were converted to Dollar Zone, another discount store brand run by the company. In February 2002, McCrory's folded. Now, the reason I was not familiar with J.J. Newberry is, well, because of where I lived. Except for eight years of my life, I've lived either outside or inside Chicago, so I never heard of J.J. Newberry because they were primarily located in the northeastern United States and the West Coast and a few locations in Canada. Even by the time I moved to New Jersey in 1998, all the Newberry stores in Jersey were gone, although there was still some J.J. Newberry signage remaining at its abandoned location in downtown Long Branch by the shore. Now that I've talked about the death of J.J. Newberry and his stores, let's talk about something that's keeping their memory alive. This grand opening record. This record, which I'm simply going to call Memorial Store Opening Ceremony for brevity's sake, is on the Fulton Recording Company label. Fulton Recording Company, founded in or shortly before 1951, was located at 80 West 40th Street in Midtown Manhattan, where its studios, control rooms, cutting facilities, storage rooms, and offices occupied the 3rd and 10th floors. That's an interesting little division in the building. The record itself is pressed on red 10-inch microgroove vinyl for playback at 33 and a third revolutions per minute. It's contained in a plain brown sleeve made for 10-inch records. Now, my copy came with its original shipping envelope shaped and sized exactly perfectly for a 10-inch record, and it was postmarked July 1st, 1953, shortly after this ceremony happened. The return address was J.J. Newberry Company, 245 Fifth Avenue, New York 16. I don't know if that's a store or maybe a New York headquarters or office or something. Um, if anybody knows for sure, please let me know. The destination address, J.J. Newberry Company, 289, 6602 Hollywood Boulevard, Hollywood 28, California. Now, I was able to confirm that the Hollywood address was indeed a J.J. Newberry store at some time. A sign on the store advertised, Gloves, Millinery, Hosiery, Lingerie, or Lingerie as some people say. Uh, millinery, by the way, is clothing specifically made for women's heads, uh, in case you didn't know. I didn't think of checking when I was in Hollywood a couple of years ago, but the last time I checked Google Maps, that location was Hollywood Toys and Costumes, and in the same place where the aforementioned sign was located is a sign saying, Leisurely and Costumes, interestingly. On the mailer, there's a note saying that it's a radio transcription disc and that it's very important that it get to the destination address ASAP. Now, if you don't know what a transcription disc is, here's hopefully a very brief explanation. A transcription disc is made to be played on the radio. They're very unusual records in that, first of all, most tended to be 16 inches in diameter, much too large for most home turntables. In fact, if you watch WKRP in Cincinnati, you'll notice that the turntables in their stations are huge. That's because radio turntables needed to accommodate 16-inch records in the event that a program they had was shipped to them on a transcription disc. Eventually, transcription discs were uh, shipped on 12-inch vinyl, such as the Dr. Demento show was for a while. Another thing about transcription discs is that they tended to be made of much higher quality vinyl than most commercially made records because it was important to minimize surface noise. Remember, these were supposed to be broadcasted on the air. The 16-inch transcription discs also have wider groove concentrics to maximize sound quality. 
The wider the space between grooves, the better the sound is going to be. In fact, you may have noticed that when you play a lot of your records, the sound quality might actually degrade as you get closer to the label. Part of that is because the closer you are to the label, the closer the groove concentrics are going to be. Uh, the other part of that is uh, the speed in which the surface crosses the stylus. But uh, let's uh, go away from that and talk about the record itself. Uh, interestingly, this J.J. Newberry grand opening record has none of those features. Again, it's a 10-inch record, and at least side one has a lot of surface noise. I'm guessing that maybe whoever received it played side one and kind of never thought of flipping it over, like, okay, yeah, I get the point. Other people did the same thing, probably played side one. Oh, this is cool. Yeah, our store, grand opening. Yeah, I don't need to hear the rest of it. Side two on the record, though, has virtually no surface noise. So that's kind of why I'm thinking no one ever really thought to play the other side. What I'm especially curious about is why this record was sent to a J.J. Newberry store in Los Angeles, or why there was a radio transcription disc made. I mean, I can't imagine KRLA essentially airing a half-hour commercial for a dime store for a grand opening that happened all the way across the country. I would love to ask Dwight G. Davis, to whom the envelope is addressed, but he's probably long gone by now. I'm guessing maybe he was the manager of the Hollywood store. To see if I could get at least the slightest hint, I went to the person who sold me the record. I bought the record from a user on Discogs.com named Uncle Jim. Jim says he bought it at an estate sale in Southern California. Most likely the owner of it was either the manager of a West Coast J.J. Newberry or more likely worked for the West Coast headquarters. It's not likely that the store opening transcription discs were intended for radio stations, but possibly for store employees. Now, what's on the record itself? Well, stick around and find out. Memorial Store Opening contains a few speeches delivered at a brand new J.J. Newberry store, which opened at 600 Main Street in Stroudsburg. Well, it's not really necessarily a new store, it's more that the original flagship store moved to a much bigger location. Now this is interesting, Joe Webster introduces Dale H. Learn. Now to open the ceremonies, here is Dale H. Learn, president of the Pocono Mountains Chamber of Commerce. Uh, Joe Webster himself was introduced by someone else whose name um, I don't think appears anywhere on the record, either in the audio or on the label. Definitely not on the label. We now take you to the new J.J. Newberry store for a broadcast of the grand opening ceremonies. Now, Dale H. Learn pretty much brags about Stroudsburg, as I guess he should, as uh, being president of the Chamber of Commerce. He talked about how there are a lot of religious people in Stroudsburg, how Stroudsburg has state-of-the-art schools, friendly people, golf courses. Basically, all kinds of reasons Stroudsburg is such a wonderful place, although he admits that the parking sucks. We have ample parking space, but we do need more of that, we must admit. But there are ultra-modern stores including the new J.J. Newberry store, of course. We are happy this morning to welcome to this community now the new J.J. Newberry store. We believe one of the finest Newberry stores or store of any kind throughout the East. Basically, Dale H. Learn's speech served as a three-minute introduction to J.J. Newberry himself. Friends, the head of the Newberry stores... Mr. J. J. Newberry. John Josiah Newberry takes the microphone and he thanks the people of Stroudsburg and apologizes for blocking the sidewalks. First of all, I want to express the thanks of our company to all of you Monroe County people who were so patient and tolerant to put up with this hole in the ground here for so long and all the sidewalk obstructions. Apparently there was a delay before or during construction, but what that delay was or what caused it was not mentioned. He talked about how he took a Lackawanna train to Stroudsburg and was impressed by the business district and found the area to be friendly and livable. Newberry himself lived in Stroudsburg for eight years, starting in 1911. He talked about how Ernest Wyckoff tore down an old landmark hotel and built a modern department store in its place. Um, I'm guessing that department store was A.B. Wyckoff's, which his family owned. And according to Newberry, it's that store that seemed to launch, and I quote, Stroudsburg's great popularity as a retail center. 
Newberry called Wyckoff one of his very best friends. In 1919, J.J. Newberry got his brother Charlie, who worked at Woolworths, to be his partner. They incorporated four years into the partnership and moved the company's headquarters to New York City, probably the return address that was on the mailer. Just as he's about to cut the ribbon, Newberry promises the people that they would be amazed as they look around the store. He promised conscientious expertise from his staff. Then Newberry talks about how he met Sebastian S. Kresge in Detroit, and he introduced him to speak. So yeah, we get to hear from the founder of S.S. Kresge Dime Store, which kind of evolved more or less into what we probably remember as Kmart. So S.S. Kresge takes the microphone, and um, judging by the speech, he wasn't the most experienced public speaker. Kind of dry, not all that fun to listen to. <laughs> it may look presumptuous, <clears throat> To come to uh, my old county seat, rather, and uh, help open up one of the most wonderful stores in the country. Notice he didn't say the most wonderful store in the country. He probably wants to reserve that for his own. Kresge was a teacher in Monroe County when he was 19, and he made $22 a month. Uh, yeah, teachers who are listening to this right now are thinking, man, the more things change. <laughs> he walked two miles to work and back home, and he predicted that that $22 a month would be what the new J.J. Newberry store would take in today. So, uh, yeah, it makes a little joke. But it's clear that Kresge, despite being a rival of Newberry, was also a dear friend of his. He heaped a lot of praise on Newberry. And he said that the three most notable buildings in Stroudsburg's would be the Wyckoff Department Store, the YMCA that was under construction at the time, and J.J. Newberry. He talked about being at the grand opening of a Cress store, not Kresge, in West Palm Beach, and he expressed admiration for his competition. And before he finished speaking, Kresge predicted success for the new J.J. Newberry store. Now, because of the quality of the recording, I know it's not that the record itself is of bad quality. It's just uh, the recording technology used for an outdoor speech. Um, I couldn't tell whether Joe Webster was introducing Don W. Hayes or Dom W. Hayes. The record label just says D.W. Hayes. And Hayes was the store's manager. He started out as a stalker at the Newberry store in Hagerstown, Maryland, 20 years earlier, and basically worked his way up. So when it's Hayes' turn to speak, he says that the new store is the most beautiful of the J.J. Newberry stores he'd seen during his 20 years with the company. Friends, this is truly a most beautiful store, the Newberry Company, that I've witnessed in my 20 years with them. And uh, I'm mighty proud that uh, I've been chosen by Mr. Newberry and his associates. I think that they have the confidence in me that I can manage this store. He called up five ladies for... Uh whatever reason, I guess there to be honorary cutters or something. Uh, there is Mrs. William E. Robinson, Mrs. Herbert Bonser, Mrs. Gladys Mitchell of Toms River, New Jersey, Mrs. Walter Brown of East Stroudsburg, uh, another lady whose name I couldn't make out, Mrs. Alice Wine, sounded like, of East Stroudsburg. Uh, the other women, he did not say from where they hail. Hayes then hands the scissors to Mayor Hal Harris, who made a brief speech calling J.J. Newberry the finest store in the finest town of America. And for whatever reason, Joe Webster felt it necessary to go into great detail to describe the gold-plated scissors, the white ribbon, the lineup of representatives at the ribbon, including Newberry himself, the mayor, etc. And the record ends abruptly after Webster says it's officially open for business. Just getting all set for a final picture now before the, he cuts the ribbon. Mr. Harris is now approaching the ribbon now. Holding the ribbon in his left hand, scissors in the right hand. There he goes now, he's cutting the ribbon, and the new J.J. Newberry store is officially open for business. Before we get into my personal thoughts on this memorial store opening record, it does make me think that now would be an opportune time to discuss some care and handling tips that I've been kind of reserving for a while. A while. I, this is, what, the third time I released an episode? Regardless, though, remember that this record came in a 10 by 10 inch brown paper record sleeve inside a 10 and a half by 10 and a half inch mailer. Now, back in 1953, when this record was made, 
Obviously, not a lot of thought was put into how to package this thing carefully. Records were taken for granted. Thankfully, the records survived for 70 years in pretty good shape, and now we're all bright enough to take better care of these precious pieces of vinyl. The first thing I did, and the first thing you should do when getting a record, whether it be new or used, if the record itself is in a paper sleeve inside a cover, take it out of that paper sleeve and put it into an anti-static plastic sleeve, or if nothing else, at least a paper sleeve that has a plastic liner. Paper sleeves might damage the playing surface of the record. The reason that a lot of your records might have paper sleeves is, chances are they're American, and American record companies would do everything they could to cheap out. And if you don't believe me, look at the Beatles' American albums versus their European equivalents. <laughs> but my go-to for inner sleeves is made by Mobile Fidelity Sound Labs, the same label that makes audiophile records and CDs. But really, any anti-static sleeve that's archival grade will do just as well. Mobile Fidelities come in packs of 50. Uh, there's just one little problem, though. The record I'm talking about today is a 10-inch record, and Mobile Fidelity only makes inner sleeves for 12-inch records, at least as of this recording. But I did manage to find 10-inch polylined acid-free paper sleeves by Fakmogu. I think I'm pronouncing that right. If not, I apologize. And thankfully, those sleeves come in packs of only 20, uh, still more 10-inch records than I actually own. Fakmogu's sleeves come in black and white, and they come with uh, 7, 10, and 12-inch options. Now, thankfully, the seller of this J.J. Newberry record was wise enough to not be satisfied with just the mailer and the inner sleeve. The record was shipped to me in a plastic outer record sleeve. Because the mailer is too big for an outer sleeve meant for a 10-inch record, the plastic outer sleeve that this was shipped in was actually made for a 12-inch record. But still, I strongly encourage you to protect your record covers by keeping them in outer sleeves. I used to not do that, actually. I thought that was going a bit overboard until I saw what was happening as I was pulling records out of the shelf. A little thing called friction <laughs> caused some extra wear and tear on the bottoms of the covers. So now I keep my albums, my 10-inchers, and uh, most of my 7-inchers in outer plastic covers. Mobile Fidelity also makes outer sleeves, although most of the ones I use are from either Vinyl Style or Big Fudge. But whatever brand you use, if not either one of those, just make sure that the outer sleeve does not contain PVC, because PVC has been known to cause severe damage to the record itself. Yes, the record, even though the record would be in its own sleeve and it would have a cover between it and the outer sleeve. But most sleeves that you buy these days are going to be PVC free. Now, something else that I do is I typically don't actually put the records inside their original covers. The album cover goes into the outer sleeve empty, and then the record itself goes inside the plastic inner sleeve, which itself also goes into the outer sleeve, separate from the record, outside of the cardboard record cover. In other words, the record and the cover are together inside the outer sleeve, but the record is not inside the cover. The reason that I do that is to prevent additional wear and tear on the cover. Many record collectors think that's overdoing it and that it defeats the purpose of having a record cover in the first place, but I want my covers to be in good shape too. I guess my advice to you is to see which way you prefer. If the outer cover of a particular record is in good enough shape and looks like it can support the weight of the record and anything else that's inside the cover over a long period of time, then by all means keep the record in the cover. If you see that the cover is really wearing out at the bottom, you might want to consider using a clear outer sleeve. If you're fortunate enough to have easy access to a record store, especially one that specializes in used records, chances are pretty good that they sell inner sleeves and outer sleeves. If not, the good news is if you go to this podcast's website at myweirdrecords.fab4it.com, uh, fab4it being spelled F-A-B, the number four, and then I-T, go to that site, click Stuff I Recommend, and then Storage. You'll see links to the products that I mentioned on Amazon. If you purchase these products via these links, I get a small portion of the sale at no extra charge to you. Yeah. 
as for my personal thoughts on Memorial Store opening, just to remind you, or if you haven't heard the first episode yet, I give these odd records a rating based on five factors. Local interest, historical interest, uniqueness, weirdness, and enjoyability, giving each factor a score of 1 through 5 inclusive, giving a composite score of 5 through 25 inclusive. First, the local interest rating of Memorial Store Opening. There is no question I'm giving the local interest rating a 5. J.J. Newberry was a chain of stores that only existed in select parts of the United States and Canada. Again, I never heard of J.J. Newberry until I moved to New Jersey, and even then, all the stores were closed in that area. I heard about those stores courtesy of my wife. When I posted a picture of this record to my Facebook timeline, my friend Neil, who grew up in upstate New York, was very interested in it, so obviously this record kind of rang a bell for him. I asked my mother-in-law what she remembered about J.J. Newberry, and she said, well, mostly the lunch counter, so it tells me that J.J. Newberry was kind of a Woolworths-like place. The store itself was started in Stroudsburg, Pennsylvania, and the record contains the opening ceremony of another Stroudsburg location. With just a quick lookup of J.J. Newberry itself in your favorite internet search engine, you'll learn quite a lot about Stroudsburg pretty quickly. This record absolutely is a local curiosity. Historical interest? Let me tell you, this record is a vinyl time capsule. It captures the opening of a much larger J.J. Newberry store to replace its smaller original store. And it's a souvenir of a store that, as mighty as it once was, took a mighty fall into obsolescence. One might argue that not just J.J. Newberry is obsolete, but the entire concept of a five and dime, although in some places you'll still stumble across a five and dime. Uh, case in point, I know of an extant Ben Franklin at the Jersey Shore. On this record, you have not only the founder of J.J. Newberry, but also Sebastian S. Kresge, the founder of Kmart, another store that before long will be but a memory. I cannot possibly give the historical interest factor of this record a rating lower than 5. How about the uniqueness factor of the J.J. Newberry Memorial Store opening record? Well, okay, so grammarians will argue that something is either unique or not unique. There's no degree of uniqueness, but hey, just stick with me here. For one thing, this is colored vinyl. It's red. I don't think I knew that when I bought it online, so I was quite pleasantly surprised when this red record arrived. And it's a 10-incher. I don't have many 10-inch records in my collection. And just to add to the uniqueness of the record being a 10-incher, it's a transcription disc. Actually, transcription discs often tend to be a non-black color, usually red or blue, but also they're usually 16 inches in diameter. But that this transcription disc is only 10 inches in diameter makes it quite the curiosity. Transcription discs aren't all that common in general. They're typically made for radio play and not for consumer distribution. So far, I can assume at least two copies exist. Mine, and I recently saw on Discogs.com that another user claims to have a copy. And that this record was likely not even meant for airplay really makes it unique. And what really clinches a rating of 5 for me? The packaging, or lack thereof. The record was likely distributed in the plain brown sleeve in which I received the record, but that plain brown sleeve was included in a 10-inch mailer. Just the mailer itself, with its labels and postmark, tells a little story of days gone by. Now, in rating the weirdness of a record, hmm, that's where things can get a little hairy. Some of the reasons one might consider this record weird is actually covered by uniqueness. So my strategy for my weirdness rating was to note my wife's reaction to my spending money on this record. I honestly thought she'd find this record interesting because she remembers the J.J. Newberry stores. But when she saw what I was opening when the package arrived, she was speechless. She could only react by giving me weird looks. Lisa reminded me that one of the reasons she agreed to marry me was that life would not be boring. Well, she clearly was not bored. When my friend Neil publicly expressed interest in this record, his wife had to point out to the world that her husband expressed interest in it. Judging by the reactions of my peers, I cannot help but give this record a weirdness rating of 5. How about enjoyment? Well, 
honestly, listening to people wax philosophical about, or perhaps completely gushing over the concept of a discount store. Now, you find this hard to believe, but it's not the most exciting thing in the world. I've been to a similar ceremony myself. My first job was at a public library, and some time before I started there, a passerby threw a Molotov cocktail through a window on the first floor, causing significant damage. All the materials that survived the fire were relocated to a temporary satellite location in a nearby abandoned department store while cleanup and repairs happened. At the same time, a huge expansion was being built onto the library building. I was working the day of the grand opening of the expansion, which coincided with the reopening of the first floor. We had a similar ceremony to what J.J. Newberry had. Several speakers, and not just the library's director, but if I recall correctly, the mayor and a local rabbi. The ceremony kicked off with a guy singing The Impossible Dream, accompanied by an electronic keyboard. My eyes are still tired from all the rolling they did that day. Of course, I was 16 years old at the time, so my teen angst slash intolerance probably didn't help. But the fact is, it was boring. I just wanted to go inside and work. I can imagine there were people who just wanted Kresge, Hayes, and Newberry to just shut up and let people shop. However... It is cool to hear the owner of a business speak kindly about his competitors. It's not the most boring thing to hear, but it's not the most edge-of-your-seat listening either, so I will rate the enjoyability factor 3 out of 5. So, with a rating of 5 for both local and historical interest, 5 for uniqueness, 5 for weirdness, and 3 for enjoyability, the J.J. Newberry Memorial Store opening record scores a 23 out of a possible 25, ergo putting it on the top of my chart above both albums from the Singing Johnson family. Personally, though, I'm seriously glad I have this record for both its historical and local interest. Also because it's a 10-inch record. I don't know why, but I love 10-inch records. It seems to me that most 10-inch records from the 50s and before are the old shellac kind that play back at 78 RPMs, but this one is a standard microgroove record on vinyl that spins at 33 and a third. And it's red! I am a sucker for colored vinyl! The price was really good, too. I only paid a few bucks for it on Discogs.com, whereas doing a price check on other records on the Fulton Recording Company label tend to demand some seriously hefty prices. I love everything about the record. The color, the size, the packaging, the subject, and even the mailer. If you would like to hear the entire contents of this record, I have good news for you. Because I strongly believe in preservation, I have digitized the audio and uploaded it to my YouTube channel. There's a separate video for each side of the record, but I compiled them into a playlist, and I will link that playlist in this episode's show notes at myweirdrecords.fab4it.com, or you can just go to my YouTube channel at youtube.com slash at sign my weird record collection. And friends, that wraps up episode two of my weird record collection. Do you have any thoughts on this album or any other weird records? You can reach me via email at myweirdrecords at fab4it.com. And again, fab4it is spelled F A B, the number four and then IT.com. You can reach me on Twitter, Instagram, and now Blue Sky under the handle My Weird Records. And you can find this podcast on Facebook as well by searching for My Weird Record Collection or going directly to Facebook.com slash My Weird Records. If this podcast is not available on your preferred podcast provider, let me know. I'll do everything I can to make sure that... Uh, It'll be distributed there. Oh, and by the way, sounds and music in this podcast remain the properties of the respective copyright holders and are used for commentary and review. No infringement is intended. Many, many thanks to Kevin Zerb for the logo for this podcast. You can visit Kevin's website at zerbinator.com. Coming up next for episode three of my weird record collection. Well, you're going to learn about how to tune and play a instrument. Can't wait. Seems like a rip roaring time. In the meantime, please support your local record store. If you are lucky enough to have one. Thank you for listening. And exaggerate your mouth movements. The weird record. Yep, there's a siren going by. Don't know if y'all can hear that. Uh, I live down the street from a 
fire station and a very busy street too. So there are ambulances and fire trucks going by all the time. Okay, it's gone now. I can start. <laughs>